Hello, everybody, and, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for the second event in our resilience series, Fire and Flood. Uh, we have, looks like, 18 folks live in the audience right now, and we do expect that to climb a little bit more as the evening progresses. Um, my name is Aaron Leffland. I'm the executive director of the New Canaan Land Trust. Um, the Land Trust is thrilled to partner with the New Canaan Library, who in October of 2020 was awarded the American Library Association's Resilient Communities Grant. And the basic premise for this grant is to screen films and host public programs that encourage community conversations around climate change. Along the way, we've received support from Planet New Canaan, the New Canaan Conservation Commission, and other partners in New Canaan's Pollinator Pathway. Uh, as I mentioned, tonight is the second event in the four-part series, uh, the Resilience Series, and will feature a discussion and question and answer session about the film Fire and Flood, Queer Resilience in the Era of, Era of Climate Change. The next part of our Resilience Series will take place on April 24th, where we'll host a community conference about the film Decoding the Weather Machine, and then culminate on May 12th, when we'll welcome Dr. Dr. Andrew Reinman to give a lecture about trees and green infrastructure, and will also be the time that we relaunch the, uh, a new citizen science project called the New Canaan Champion Tree Project. Um, if you have not yet registered for uh, the remainder of the series, we encourage you to do so, either on the New Canaan Land Trust or New Canaan Library's events calendars. Before I turn it over to Kayla from the library to make a few introductions, I want to go over a few Zoom housekeeping items. Uh, the first is that we ask that you use a, the, the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen as the main way of communicating with us as panelists. Uh, things do tend to get a little bit lost in the chat just as more folks add things. So if you do have a question and you want it answered, be sure to use the Q&A feature. Um, and then the other thing to note is that I believe we're using Zoom's closed captioning feature, which you'll be able to toggle on and off. Um, there's a little menu uh, kind of right next to the Q&A feature. Um, and you can toggle that on and off if you if you want to use it or, or don't have the need. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Kayla Del Biondo, the uh, coordinator of adult programming and outreach at New Canaan Library to get things started. Thank you, Aaron. I'm super excited that we have such a hefty panel tonight and that we're kicking off um, the second part of the four part series, as Aaron said. I hope that most audience members were able to watch Fire and Flood. And if you weren't, um, this conversation can be a good primer and maybe you will watch it later tonight or later this week. Um, it's gonna be my pleasure to introduce Christina Boyles who will get us started tonight and kind of segue into the rest of the panelists introductions. Christina Boyles is an assistant professor of culturally engaged digital humanities at Michigan State University. Her research explores the relationship between disaster, social justice, and the environment. She is director of the, I'm going to try and say this right, Archivo de Repuestas Emergencias de Puerto Rico, a project that works with community organizations to collect and preserve oral histories and disaster related artifacts about hurricanes Irma and Maria. Puerto Rico's recent spate of her uh, earthquakes and COVID-19. She's also co-finder of Serve DH, a community that explores the intersections between surveillance and the humanities. Her published work appears in Digital Humanities Quarterly, Bodies of Information, Feminist Debates in the Digital Humanities, American Quarterly, and more. Thank you, Christina. I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for inviting us and having us here today. We're thrilled to talk to you. I am here with my incredible team uh, from the Archivo de Respuestas Emergencias de Puerto Rico. Um, and we have four project teams, three of which are represented here today. Um, so our first project team is from the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. And we will have Valeria um, Fernandez Gonzalez and Marisa Gonzalez Velez joining us from that team. Our second team is from the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez, and we have Risha Chansky joining us from that team. And our third team that will speak tonight is our tech team located at Michigan State University, and that includes Elisa Landaverde and Andy Boyles Peterson. Um, so I'm excited to get to speak with all the members of my team who are uh, incredible people to work with, um, and I'm very excited to get to share our work with you. Uh, we did put together just a handful of slides to give you some visuals about what kind of work we're doing. So I'm going to share those with you now. If you can't see that at all, please let me know. All 
right, here we go. So this, hopefully the slides are being shared with you. Um, so I wanna start by just giving you a brief overview of what the project is. Um, the Archivo de Respuestas Emergencias de Puerto Rico or the Emergency Response Archive of Puerto Rico is an open access digital repository collecting disaster related artifacts pertaining to the Puerto Rican experience of hurricanes Irma and Maria, which happened in 2017, a spate of earthquakes that started in 2019 and are still ongoing, and COVID-19. And we're looking at these particular events as they're all very recent um, and they show us the relationship between public policy, federal policy, um, climate change, and community action. Um, the thing we're really focused on is the ways in which uh, Puerto Rican individuals and community organizations developed innovative response strategies to these events and provided incredible support for their neighborhoods and their communities in ways that we value and we think deserve to be shared with the world. To give you a very brief idea of what some of these materials look like, I was going to try and share a short video um, that kind of compiles a few of the interviews that we took in 2018. Now, to be fair, these interviews were taken before the start of this project, so they might be just a little bit different than what you'll see as we start collecting um, this semester and as our students start working with us, but they are the original impetus that got us started on this project and gave us the inspiration to develop it out in this larger capacity. So I am going to try to play this video, and if you can't hear, please let me know. Cuando llega María, no solamente un segundo huracán en dos semanas, sino que es más fuerte todavía. Así que la experiencia fue terrible porque el huracán devastó en nuestra isla, eh, en nuestras comunidades. Eh, y eso ha tenido consecuencias que son pues, muy nefastas. It took three, almost four months to get power and almost three months to get water. Fueron muy pocas las agencias que llegaron al momento que estaba eh, la situación en su punto, como digo yo. La fue muy poca. En los primeros dos o tres semanas, no vimos nada. No vimos a la policía, no vimos al mayor de San Juan, no vimos nada. Fue solo nosotros. Fue difícil. María fue un elevador para todos. La mayor parte de lo que ella ayuda a hacer en el mismo fue de la comunidad. Fue de la comunidad de ciudadanos, de organizaciones, de iglesia, nos apoyaron mucho. I remember when Trump came, he was just like, um, oh, you only have like, I don't know, 20 people died. And I was like, no, those numbers are not real. But it also has a lot to do with our government. Because I don't think they have been as transparent as they could. Because if, I think if you would just, just display the real number of deaths and the real number of damage that was in the island, maybe you would get the help. Tan reciente como hace dos semanas aproximadamente, un vecino de mi barrio este, intentó suicidarse desde lo alto de una torre de energía eléctrica. Él representó y simbolizó cómo nos sentimos y, y hasta dónde llega nuestra desesperación luego de ocho meses de estar sin luz todavía, sin servicio de agua. I'm sure they have all PTSD. Like, if it rains a lot, they're like, they start looking for the river. Like, is it coming up? Like, we have to go. And that's very scary because you're not safe in your own home. From, from September up to January, it was 68 dogs that I rescued from the street. Muchas personas se están yendo del país. Muchas veces que el sistema educativo aprovechó el proceso de una gran para cerrar escuelas. Para mí es bien triste que cada vez que bajo los fines de semana a mi hogar, ver un, un negocio cerrado, ver eh, un mini mall que tenemos en Yabuca que solo tiene abierta actualmente una tienda. Our infrastructures cannot afford another year yet. Muchas personas perdieron sus pechos y, y el que llegaran los toldos que se prestan para eso, que usualmente no, no presta FEMA, pues ha tardado muchísimo. Everybody hate María. I, I bet you nobody's put their names to their, to their daughters. So as you can see from that short, 
apologies. Um, as you can see from that short video that just gives some highlights of some of the interviews that we've conducted, um, there are a lot of similarities between the work that we're doing and Fire and Flood, if you had a chance to watch it. Um, both of our projects really focused on the lived experiences of people who've gone through environmental crisis and particularly on their stories and the ways that they share their experience. You also notice that both of our projects include both English and Spanish at all times, um, or I believe in Fire and Flood, there are also some other languages uh, represented, but we wanna make sure that um, when we are sharing our materials with uh, Puerto Rico, with other parts of the Caribbean, with communities across North America, that we're representing the um, experiences of our participants and those willing to work with us in the languages that they prefer and also um, making it as accessible as possible. Because our biggest goal is for these um, materials to reach other communities in the Caribbean. Um, to tell you a little bit more about the projects I mentioned earlier, we do have four projects teams, three of which are here today. And I wanted to um, show this slide just to show you kind of the number of people working on this project and the variety of different positions they hold. We have um, faculty members at universities, librarians, students, community organizations. Um, so we have a really impressive team working with us. But um, in order for the project to be successful, uh, we are, um, um, we get to benefit from all of the contributions that all of our members can make. So we are dependent on our network network um, being as amazing as they are. And so um, some of those members are here today and they'll tell you a little bit about the work that they're doing. Um, this project launched in July. Um, and so uh, given the state of the world right now with COVID-19, we had initially planned to come together in an in-person conference or symposium to train our participants and our students on how to work to gather and collect uh, disaster-related artifacts from individuals and community groups. But a lot of this training has now happened online. Um, and so if you're interested in seeing any of the workshops that we've hosted thus far, do feel free to check out our page on Vimeo, which has um, our workshops available. Um, uh, just a few more notes about kind of the overview of the project before I pass that off to our first team. Um, we see our project as taking um, what we've termed a feminist decolonial approach, and we see this in a few ways. Uh, the first is that we're using what's called post-custodial archiving practice, which means that the ownership of materials retain with the person who, who created it. Um, so what that would mean in an oral history is the person who's telling the story has the rights to their story and they get to determine how that story is shared and where it is shared. The same is true of other types of materials, whether that be photos or handwritten notes um, that have been digitized. We want the person who, who's in the photo, the person who experiences being represented to know um, that they get to choose how their experience is shared. And this is really important. Um, if you did get a chance to see Fire and Flood, you'll notice it talked a little bit about the colonial relationship between the mainland United States and Puerto Rico. And we hope that this structure pushes back against those notions of ownership um, and creates a more equitable uh, framework for our participants. The other thing this model does is it shifts notions of expertise to say that the people who've experienced these crises are the experts and we are there to help support them and share their stories as they see fit. But we are not the experts. We are the support team. And I think that's a really important way uh, to think about the project. So uh, the second way we take this approach is uh, our two project teams in Puerto Rico are taking different approaches to the project based on their own expertise and experience. Uh, so our team at Rio Piedras is partnering with community organizations and working with them to document the ways in which they responded to these crises. And our team in Mayaguez is working more on an individual and small group basis to train students to go out and collect oral histories uh, to learn about individual experiences and both of those are just incredible parts of our project. Um, 
Before I turn it over to Valeria, um, who I will have speak next, I did want to just um, point out a few of the connections to Fire and Flood, if you had a chance to watch it already. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, our focus is on the lived experience of the people we're working with um, and our project that is uh, Puerto Ricans. And we are also looking at the connections between climate change, racial, racial justice, and colonialism. We see um, the work being done done by these communities on the ground in Puerto Rico as being innovative, exciting new knowledge systems that are incredible sources of, of meaning that we can all learn from and that um, really push back against the ways in which um, disaster response was handled by both the federal government and the Puerto Rican government. Um, so really, we're really excited to get to um, preserve those materials and share them with you. Uh, so to, um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our project teams uh, to hear a little bit more about the kinds of work they're doing. Uh, Valeria, if you'd be willing to go next, um, we are going to talk about what's happening at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. Sure. Hi. Uh, good night to everybody. Thank you all for being here and a shout out to the New Canaan Library for organizing this event. And also I wanna give out a shout out to Vanessa Raditz, which is the director of Fire and Flood, and which I had the privilege to collaborate and be in the documentary. Um, I am the project manager in the Archivo de Respuestas de Emergencia de Puerto Rico. My role is sort of to establish the link between the community organizations and, and the project, especially the, the UPR Rio Piedras team and the Michigan State University team. But before going into the specifics of my role as a project manager in, in this um, project, I want to talk a little bit about my experience uh, being in the fire and flood film. That was, um, I think it was about maybe April or May 2019, almost two years ago, when the actual uh, interview was recorded. And it was an extremely great and pleasant experience to be able to be part of such an important film which portrays uh, the different types of resilience that we experienced in Puerto Rico. And it was also very rewarding for me to see the, the film in, in the complete film. I was only able to see the teaser. So I saw the complete film uh, recently, just between yesterday and today. So it was very rewarding to see it completely. And it was um, very rewarding and a great experience to be able to see um, the experiences of the folks in California and their resilience with the fires, which I think is a very important dialogue that was um, portrayed in the film, how, how um, each of us could respond community-based to, to those different um, emergencies, which are particularly different, hurricanes and fires, but what is the, the common point is how all of these communities sort of came together and responded in a way that the government wasn't responding to these specific communities, which are the LGBTQIA plus communities um, in Puerto Rico and in different parts of, of the United States. So that was a very rewarding experience. I think um, that we are still kind of in, in a processing of the shock that was experiencing Hurricane Maria. We definitely never had a hurricane like that. And different from other hurricanes, like the George hurricane, which I experienced as a child, um, I think a very, a very um, distinguishing um, characteristic of Maria is that it affected the whole island, including the municipalities of Vieques and Culebra, which are other islands part of our archipelago. And in other hurricanes, some parts of the island weren't as affected as others, and we could help each other out. But throughout Maria, all of the island was devastated and it was something without precedent. So I think um, the roles that community organizations took were vital to our survival, to our every, to our day-to-day -day survival and to be able to, to see that portrayed in a film that um, dialogues with how that community organization came to be in different communities in California was uh, a very rewarding experience for me and I'm very grateful for that. 
Um, talking a little bit more specific with what is my role in this project, I mainly establish contact with the five organizations we are working with, which are um, Comedores Sociales de Puerto Rico, which is an amazing organization that, amongst other things, focuses mostly in, in um, food resilience, in sustentabilidad alimentaria, um, and they were very, they have had very important role in in um, different um, instances in in Puerto Rico in the university, for example, in the different strikes that we had in the University of Puerto Rico in the 2017 strike, they they had a, a, a comedor social and they gave food to everybody during the strike. And during after the hurricane, they they provided with food and um, with uh, groceries to families and to people. So, so they do a very important and very beautiful work. So it's an honor to be working with them and visualizing their work. Um, we, are, we are also working with El Puente, eh, Enlace Latino de Acción Climática, which is an organization that focuses on climate change and providing education about climate change, amongst other things. I'm being very brief. Uh, about the organizations uh, because of time purposes, but I encourage everybody to to look um, to look them up. Um, we are also working with uh, Junte Gente, which is uh, an organization that came to be in the 2017 uh, student strike in the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. They first uh, were an organization where professors organized themselves to sort of provide aid to the students and sort of accompany the students in their demands in the in the strike that we were going through. And they they were named before PARES, which stands for Profesores Autoconvocados en Resistencia Solidaria. And they did transition to Vi Junta Gente, which is an organization that provides um, community-based talks about different important subjects in the island, like austerity, austerity measures, the fiscal oversight board, um, the, the auditor, the auditoria de la deuda, um, climate change, gender studies themes. So we're sort of bringing the subjects that we talk about in academia and in the, um, and in the classes to sort of the communities, to sort of the, the people to people conversations. So it's a very important space that, that they, that they provide. We are also working with ETS, which stands for Instituto Transdisciplinario de uh, Acción e Investigación Social, the Transdisciplinary Institute for um, Research and Social Action. They are based in Umacao, Puerto Rico, which is uh, the municipality of the island where Maria came through. So they were uh, particularly really affected. And uh, most of their um, economy is based on, on fishing. And it's a, they have like a really big fisher fishermen and fisherwomen community in the eastern part of the island. So, so that institute sort of, it is in the University of Puerto Rico in Humacao. So it has um, taken time to sort of develop investigations that highlight the, that type of community response that happened after Maria in different communities of the eastern island in Fajardo and in Humacao. So they do a very interesting, interesting and important, important work in highlighting how, how that, those communities sort of came together and responded. And I think it's um, very important to contextualize that the government did very little or nothing for us. So, so community organization, community-based organization was almost everything we had. And when I talk about communities, communities can be the four neighbors that you have in the street that you live in or a more bigger community. And it was sort of the type of organization that got us through the hurricane. You know, the day after Maria, everybody was organizing brigades to sort of clean everything up from the streets. Um, and you cooked for everybody. And in communities like Omacao, Mariana Omacao and other places, they were feeding up 200, 300 people per day. So that was a, a very uh, vital aspect of, of the emergency response in Puerto Rico that it was almost 100% community-based. And the final organization we're working with is uh, Operation Blessing, which is a 
a nonprofit organization that is international, but we are working with the with the division that works in Puerto Rico, which is composed by roughly two, three people. And they are um, working right now with a community-based uh, um, centro de acopio, like a, a community center called uh, Comun um, Taller Comunidad Lagoico, which is in Santurce, Puerto Rico, which, which is an occupied school that was closed after after the hurricane, about hundreds of school of schools closed, and some of those schools got turned into community centers. And Lagoico is one of those schools that got turned into a community center, and they host um, sort of from 20ish to 30ish community-based projects, and they work sort of a, a community-based um, response center with with filters and with equipment to sort of respond if an emergency happens. And they also plan in the future to sort of work as a, as a shelter for, for future uh, emergencies. And uh, right now they are providing uh, COVID testing and COVID vaccination for elders, which is a very uh, important um, job that they're doing right now. So it's really great to sort of be able to give visibility to all of the up to all of these projects created by these amazing uh, organizations, uh, we also work with six undergraduate students from the UPR Rio Piedras, which are our student archival assistants. And right now, we are in the process of training them in oral history, in interviewing, and in digitization and trans transcription. Um, and, and each of these students are paired with a community organization, and we have a student who works with social media and, and the tech equipment. Um, I am here with, with my colleague from the UPR team, uh, Mireza Gonzalez, which is, amongst other things, uh, the, the dean of the humanities faculty. She is also a, an investigator. Um, direct co-director of the Caribbean Diaspora Project. And she and our other uh, colleague, which is the professor uh, Nadia Rios Villarini, uh, the three of us sort of orchestrate that, um, that role that we, that we play with the students and the organizations um, throughout UPR Rio Piedras. Um, I think that is all from, from my side. Um, I can pass the uh, the mic, the virtual mic to, to Miresa if she wants to um, add something or to, to whoever is next in our order. Thank you all. Thank you, Valeria. That was wonderful. Um, and a perfect transition. Um, up next, we have Risha Chansky from the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez, who also is doing some incredible work with students. So I'm excited to hear from her. Um, a quick housekeeping note, Risha, do you want me to steer the slides or would you like me to give you screen sharing? I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. What was that? Uh, if it's not a problem for you, that would be fine with me. Can you hear me? Yes, it's a little fuzzy on my end. Is it? Is anyone else hearing that? Yeah. Uh, how about now? A, a little clearer. Okay. I'm happy to do the slides, so I will do that. It's quiet. Okay, so I'm moving the microphone closer to my mouth, and I'm hoping, and I will speak a little louder so that everybody can hear me and I'm just going to dive in a little better now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to our hosts at the library this evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, Christine, if you could advance with the slide, that would be great. I just want to uh, state for everybody that I will read two very short excerpts from oral history collected from the hurricane and that they're a little bit challenging to hear, so I just want to give you a heads up that that's uh, coming. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of English at the University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez, and our courses resumed approximately 40 days after Hurricane Maria uh, made landfall in Puerto Rico on September the 20th. Um, at the time, I started a, a smaller project with just my classroom, and that project has grown in 
to a very large national community project that's had three stages, the Me Maria project, the sheltered in place project, and now my collaboration with the Archive of Disaster Responses. And I just want to walk quickly through some of the development of that, uh, those projects and how they built upon each other. I wanted to start by sharing this quote from Felix Serrano. And he is a person who we interviewed for the very first stage of our project. And I thought that what he said was so profound. Since the hurricane, I've been able to see that there is an incredible emotional need. It's up to us as individuals to try to fulfill this emotional need by listening. And I think the project that Christina has designed for us that we are collaborating on is a project that first and foremost is a project about listening and witnessing and trying to offer comfort through the radical notion that somebody who has survived disaster deserves our respect and listening to them. Uh, Christina, if you wouldn't mind advancing to me. Um, when we rejoined our classes on campus after the hurricane, uh, I didn't feel as though we could restart business as usual, just go back to the syllabus and say, okay, we are in the midst of disaster, we are in the midst of trauma, let's go back to the syllabus. And so um, being a, a professor of literature and um, also a person who studies autobiographical narratives and autobiographical acts, I invited each student enrolled in my courses to write a hurricane narrative. It was not graded, it was not mandatory, it was something that they could do if they wanted to do. Every single student turned in a hurricane memoir. All of them were on notebook paper with pencil and pen because most of us still did not have electricity or internet. Um, I read these by candlelight, and as I read them, they became harder and harder to engage with because of the stories that the students were telling me. And I share with you a small piece from Alejandra's story. Alejandra is from Aguadilla. The saddest thing was to see our neighbors digging graves in their backyard because relatives had passed away due to the lack of medical attention in Aguadilla since the only hospital had to be shut down and the electricity remained off. Um, when I engaged with this story, I realized that even after the Hurricane Memoir Project was over, we couldn't go back to business as usual because of what the students were living through and what the students had experienced. Um, I know that I don't have a ton of time, and so I didn't plan to talk about this, but one of our hosts tonight talked about the citizen scientists. So let me briefly say, that um, I did design a full academic year of courses around this idea. And the one that I want to talk to you about is the oral history course. But after the oral history course, we did design a secondary course. And I'll just tell you very briefly that um, in the first semester, we trained approximately 150 students. Um, and, and Christina, it's okay to advance now, please. Um, we, trained, we trained approximately 150 undergraduate students uh, to ethically collect, transcribe, translate, and begin editing oral histories from their home communities. These were long-form oral histories that followed a birth till now methodology. And by doing that, we tried to not reduce a human life to simply the events of the hurricane, but to understand how the hurricanes fit into a larger life. Um, we collaborated with Voice of Witness, which is a nonprofit that uses oral history for social justice, and we collaborated with the Humanities Action Lab, who um, was running part one of their initiative on climate and environmental justice. What we did in the second semester that might be of interest for some of the folks who are listening to this presentation is that we used oral histories as the primary text for active learning. And we, um, I'll just give you one example. There were numerous oral histories that talked about the lack of potable water and how finding drinking water was a huge emergency. And so the classes were divided into teams and each team got to pick a team that they wanted to work with. They studied the oral history and then they went out into the community to figure out ways to address the problem. So the potable water team took those oral histories and went out and interviewed the Surfrider Foundation. The Surfrider Foundation in Western Puerto Rico is typically studying um, the quality of the coastal waters. How is the sea water faring? 
what they did was they refigured their operations after the hurricane to go into the mountains and trap and test excuse me test freshwater sites and so students went out and were trained in water collection trained in water testing and then they made manuals that were um, both bilingual and uh, digital and analog that used the oral history of the drunken off space to say, how can we address the problems with potable water after disaster? Um, and uh, Kristen, could you please advance the slide? And I just want to share an excerpt from one of the narratives that um, I collected during this time period. When the water started coming in, it was already nighttime, around 5.30. It was September, so by that time, it was almost pitch black outside. The electricity had gone already, and the water started coming in under the front door. We were thinking, it's the wind that's pushing some water in. The hurricane was like a power washer gun pointed at every window. So we were thinking, it's just a little bit of water. And we went at it with a mop and towel and putting barriers against the doors, just like I assume the other three million Puerto Ricans were doing. And then we realized that what was coming under the door was a full flow of water. So it hit us right then and there that there must have been 12 feet of water in front of our house. And that's an excerpt from Syrah's narrative that narrative is also from Agadiza. Um, and I just wanted to show you the, the types of issues that we were coming across in, in our collective oral histories. We have approximately 150 of those oral histories at this time. Uh, Christina, could you please advance? Um, and so what are some of the outputs from this initial phase of the project? Um, we have a forthcoming book of collective oral histories. We have contributed to an international traveling exhibition and we've written a children's book. One of the um, student team decided that they wanted to respond to issues that children were facing that came up in the oral histories. And they decided one of the ways to do that would be to write a children's book about um, the hurricane. And I just wanted to say that the theme that emerged from this builds very nicely on what Valeria is saying here. The theme is community response to climate disaster. And this is done within the context of failed disaster relief at the governmental level. And I think that we have to create a space here in which we celebrate individual responses while still holding governments accountable for their failures. And that's something that was certainly um, um, out in front and in center with the oral histories that we collected. Um, Christina, if you could advance for me. And so what happened once we finished that project? Um, once we finished that project, we were faced uh, pretty close on the heels of that project with the um, COVID-19 global pandemic. And so I received a grant from the Oral History Association to explore the idea of what exactly are the connections between the aftermath of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and the crisis of COVID-19. And obviously, we know that there are multiple spaces in the world that are likewise uh, on the forefront of the climate emergency and then have these stratified layers of disaster in which your, we in particular are still working through the aftermath of the hurricane. We are facing the swarm of earthquakes and then on top of that, COVID-19. And so what, what did we find in the series of interviews that we did over um, the summer? And, and it was a really important pilot project because it helped me think about these stratified layers of disaster and stratified layers of communal trauma. We found that people are exhausted. People are absolutely exhausted that um, the government is still facing um, failures in relief and addressing the needs of the people. And we're finding that there is also now an established mistrust of government. And likewise, and I feel so I'm repeating some of the wonderful things that Valeria said, but a huge faith in what the community can do and how the community can aid. And uh, Christina, if you could just advance, I'll talk briefly about what we're doing with the archives. And so we have this 
wonderful opportunity now to revisit the project and to collaborate with some incredibly amazing and brilliant folks. And so we're continuing the pedagogical format of the New Maria project at this time in that um, uh, I am in the process of training students. This is a three-year project of, I hope to have 450 undergrads in the project in the span of three years. We'll see. Um, and, and we're again training in the ethical collection, transcription, translation, and editing of um, oral histories of disaster. The difference here is that we're, we're thinking about a digital born project and we're thinking about how are we um, preparing an archive that will be available in this non custodial model that can be easily introduced to. So we're thinking about that. And my focus is this idea of the stratified disaster and what happens when we're in the middle of a climate emergency and frontline communities, especially frontline communities that are suffering from the weight of institutionalized racism are burdened by disaster after disaster. Within that framework, um, I am very interested in food and eating. I will talk to anyone about food anytime that they would like to. And so I'm extremely interested in how we feed each other. What happens when our system to supply food breaks down? What happens when our farms are destroyed by climatological disaster. Um, the, the communal meals that Valeria was talking about were present all across the region and have this beautiful opening up of um, mutual aid and saying, what is it that I have that I can share with you? And so those are some of the things that I'm interested within uh, that resource. And Christina, if I could just have you uh, show my last slide, I will finish quickly, I promise. Um, what are some initial findings from this project that um, I feel as though I've lived and breathed for three years? Storytelling matters. Uh, when we are participants in communal trauma and when we're participants in layers of communal trauma, we do not have time to share our narratives, to tell the story of ourselves because we're busy surviving. And so offering the um, option or the space for somebody to tell their own story and to situate themselves as the narrator of the story has at least is creating an agency and empowerment. And so one of the most radical and beautiful things that we can do for another person is listen to their story. Um, this is a pedagogical project for me. It has always begun with my students and what can I do for my students? And I think Christina made the really nice point of saying, this is a project about supporting others as they share their voice. And my students get to do that. They get to go to their home communities and they get to say, where is the story in my home, maybe even in my house that hasn't been told? And the other thing is that this rewrites national narratives. Uh, when we have frontline communities, especially those who are marginalized through institutional racism, they are oftentimes not included in the national story. And so a project like this can help participants see their voice in the national story but then can help non-participants see multiple different voices in the national story. Uh, the last thing that I want to say is that a project like this asks for the reader or the recipient of a narrative to become a witness. And that on a personal level is very important. I witness you, I see you, I respect what you have survived. But then in a larger sense, that witness can be moved to action. I want to do something in the immediate moment to help people who are suffering from a climate disaster or in the larger moment and say, wait a minute, I'm starting to think about climate disaster and think about the very human cost of climate disaster and the very human cost of doing nothing. Thank you so much, Risha. I really want to hit on some of those final points as we transition into our final team that we'll be talking tonight. And that is this idea of sharing these stories to push back against some of the narratives we've heard in media about um, what's happening on the ground, and also this idea of witnessing. How do we make sure that other people get to witness these stories? Well, it actually takes quite a bit of technical work. Um, and so we are so grateful to have two members of our tech team 
here with us. Um, I believe Elisa Landaverde will be starting us off and then Andy Boyles Peterson will be closing out this section of the presentation. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Elisa Landaverde. I'm actually the Special Collections LGBTQ plus librarian at MSU Libraries. So you would think that this has nothing to do with this project. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit of the background story of how I became involved and also Robin Dean, who's sort of my co-partner in metadata, metadata stuff behind the scenes here at this particular project. Um, so at the time we were both members, Robin and I were members of the MSU Libraries Digital Repository. And we thought this archive would be a really good fit for our repository, which often includes projects um, by faculty members in collaboration with librarians. So we, um, even though neither of us had like prior experience in oral histories, besides transforming metadata from cataloged oral histories and ingesting them into our repository, we already had a set of uh, metadata standard practices uh, for the repository um, and we wanted to make use of them so that in the future metadata could e metadata from this project could easily be transferred from Omeka which was our um, um, our choice uh, for the platform uh, into our rep uh, repository um, and some of these standards relate to MOTS and DC schemas and Library of Congress subject headings. So Robin and I conducted preliminary research on bilingual metadata best practices and started looking for examples, which included uh, museums, online exhibits and repositories, which I am, you know, I think Andy also speaks Spanish, but I'm not from Puerto Rico, but my first language is Spanish. So that came really in hand for this project. It was like perfect timing there. Um, I was transitioning out of um, the repository at the time and into my current position. So there is still some relevance right there when I, as, as for me being part of the project. So um, while doing our initial search, you can imagine that most places have the option to change a page from one language to the other. That's fairly common in a lot of places, but they don't exactly display bilingual metadata side by side or provide an option to switch between languages on the metadata display. Um, so I'm not trying to throw shade on anyone. I'm sure there's someone out there who has done it but we really couldn't find anything that resembled what we were envisioning, which is also not what we were able to do in Omeka S, and Andy will cover this more in depth later. Um, so needless to say, there was some noticeable gap between our dreams and the limitations of the tools. And so at this first stage, uh, we were focusing on oral histories and best practices. Um, the oral history in the Digital Age Wiki was sort of our Rosetta Stone. It contains guides and recommendations. And as I mentioned, neither of us, Robin and I, we didn't have prior experience with oral histories. So we spent quite some time looking at repositories with oral histories, both in Spanish and English, to help us select preferred metadata formatting that was later introduced in a workshop um, in November um, the entire tech team, um, it's, I'm going to say four of us, five, four. Um, we um, conducted a workshop where we presented um, an introduction to Omega S and some oral history metadata best practices, along with some examples of preferred form formatting for our project. And although the workshop was conducted in English, um, we wanted to honor our commitment to our Spanish speaking collaborators and provided a Spanish version of the Google Slides we used in the presentation. So people could follow along during the presentation or use the slides for consultation and provide us with feedback. So while working on the workshop, we also began to discuss how we could provide a guide for metadata gathering and input into Omega S. 
And our first try at the guide focused on addressing immediate needs um, on our end. Um, and after some feedback from two of our partners, um, Nadia Rios uh, Villarini, who was uh, mentioned by Valeria, and Valeria, who's right here tonight, um, we realized that not that um, the guide very much reflected how we tend to train our students, which is to say a top-down mindset where we expected the student to simply follow the steps given by a guide or manual without much explanation for a wider context of why we're doing this thing. And it took a moment to sink in and uh, to sink in why this guy needed to address a wider goal, which is contributing to the empowerment of our partner communities by sharing resources. So initially I didn't add names to the manual because I thought it would remove a sense of ownership from our part, from our end. Um, but even this was simply implied on our end. We did not discuss this with our partners. Um, we also tried to remove some of the jargon, library jargon use um, on the project, uh, but we didn't necessarily, um, sorry, we tried to remove some of the jargon um, and the needs that, um, even that sort of like needs to be conveyed um, to our partners. Um, so they wouldn't make assumptions about some of the terms and languages we use. Um, which in many instances were chosen specifically, specifically for this project and not necessarily because they adhere to particular standards. Um, and our preferences for certain standards is yet again another thing we don't make explicit or provide resources on the manual. Um, and um, they could, that could have helped um, a, help them understand why we chose certain metadata elements or formatting of content. So to us, it seemed obvious that the manual was a guide to help with data entry and keep the consistency needed on the back end so the user could later find materials. When in reality, we should have been sharing a document our partners can also contribute to and in the future use this document as a blueprint and adapt that to their own needs. Which again, goes back to that, that entire idea of um, a, a post-colonial feature and like very much in spirit of what this project is about. And sorry, yeah, can you go to the next slides? Just, I have a couple of um, examples of, of what we did at the, this is like a side-by-side -side example of um, what we did during the workshop. You can see the, we translated both um, the, the slides we used and yeah, if you can go to the next one. Um, there you go. That's an example of the metadata manual and sort of how it looks. Um, that's just the first page of the, the manual. It's pretty much in its um, draft stage and still working on it very much. Um, and with that, I'll just turn it to Andy to dive into the restrictions and limitations of the tools. Thank you, Elisa. Um, I'm Andy Boyles peterson I'm the technical director for this project and I'm so excited to be here tonight. Uh, I'm gonna fill in a bit, but my goodness, everyone has said so much great stuff. And uh, thank you all for being such an amazing team. I'm very fortunate to be here. Uh, so as Elisa was talking about, uh, there are lots of opportunities with this, but we have ran into uh, some restrictions and limitations, uh, particularly with our online platforms and with our uh, very widespread teams. And we've got folks from across Puerto Rico that are working on this project. We've got our project uh, technical team that's here in Michigan. And then the Digital Library of the Caribbean is in Florida. So we're pretty far flung with all of this. Uh, as Elisa was touching to, library jargon has been one of the kind of challenges that we've uh, faced, so to speak. Uh, there's a lot of as with most professions, there's a lot of library jargon, things that are uh, 
structures that allow librarians to make sure that you as patrons are able to find materials, are able to access things, that between different libraries, we're able to let folks know, hey, we have this, hey, they have this, so we can interlibrary loan it, things like that. All of those systems rely on controlled vocabularies, metadata, so data about data, and oftentimes fairly complex platforms. And with all this, with this project, it's been very much a balance between uh, kind of for us as librarians wanting to uh, come in here with, with all of that uh, and uh, ease of use. So making sure that we are able to uh, have our collections findable, searchable, that community partners, once they uh, take take their data in the future and do something with it, uh, or once we put this all together on our site, that folks are able to search across that and find materials uh, without having to just scroll page by page uh, to look for an individual item. So the balance between that finding and ease of entry, uh, recognizing that we have students, uh, we have folks that will be carrying these processes into the future and making sure that uh, even if there is complex library jargon in there, that we're explaining that and explaining not just what that is, but as Elisa was saying with kind of that top-down model, um, explaining what this is, why we use it and how it benefits the project as well as partners uh, explicitly. In addition, as Elisa was alluding to, uh, with the tool Omeka S, we've ran into some limitations there. Omeka S is a wonderful platform. Uh, S stands for semantic, and Omeka S is a web collections platform. So like Google is a search engine, Facebook is a social media platform, Omeka S is a collections platform. It's something that a library, an organization, a whoever uh, could gather a collection and present that in an organized, structured format. We chose Omeka S as it's an open source tool. It was a great way that we could use it across a variety of teams. We could put information in there, pull that information out. There's great elements within it, but there's also limitations. Uh, the back end of Omeka S is quite complex. It was designed by academics, largely for academics, and that somewhat shows. And so some of the structures that are within there are not immediately self-explanatory. It additionally relies heavily on uh, kind of modules. I like to think of Omeka S as a basis as if you go to a car dealership and you say, I want a car, and then they have all the packages and the bells and whistles that you can add on. Uh, Omeka S is at a basic package, just this base standard car. And you have to choose the specific bells and whistles that you wanna put on there. And so that has been a process, kind of figuring out what those uh, additional add-ons are that we want with this project and that we need with this project and conveying that information to uh, community partners, our project teams, et cetera. Additionally, uploading materials, uh, making sure that we are linking our uh, Omeka S with, uh, we're using Amazon Web Storage, um, and making sure that that is linked, that we have processes in place for having redundant backups of data. So even though we're relying on cloud storage, we are making sure to safeguard and protect folks' information. Christina, could we go to the next slide as well? So with all of this, we've got all these structures, all this exciting stuff. Uh, one of the things that the tech team has been doing uh, has been creating technology guides. Uh, Elisa was talking about our metadata manual, uh, but we've got some others that we're working on as well as conducting trainings and workshops. Our technology guides are ongoing in development. These are things like that metadata manual, as well as information on how to conduct an oral history, how to use Omeka S and why you might use it. Uh, information on 
kind of the, the rote basics of the project, the, the uh, technology that we're sending out to capture those oral histories. So things like uh, high resolution DSLR cameras for use with uh, oral histories or for scanning large format oversized materials like a, like a shirt or a map, uh, as well as scanners and various other materials. So information on how to use all this, how it all goes together. Uh, these, there's a lot at play with this. And so we very much throughout this process want to make sure to adjust to the needs of our partners. Uh, so for us as the tech team, we're attempting to anticipate some of the needs, uh, attempting to run things past uh, our project teams in Rio Piedras and Mayaques, uh, but additionally, get feedback continually and be able to revise that and be able to kind of continue to grow this and add elements as need be. All of these materials have Creative Commons licensing, and we are hoping that these will be able to be remixed and reused, things that can be adapted and applied for other projects across the Caribbean, uh, across Puerto Rico, across the United States, across the world. Uh, there are far too many academic projects and public, private, et cetera, projects where folks do amazing, great work and then at the end of the project, it dies, it's in somebody's shoebox in their closet, and that's it. And we're hopeful that this work can be kind of compounded and built upon in the future uh, to benefit other projects. With the trainings and workshops, we're doing a lot of the same things, a goal of replicability and usability. Uh, we had a, a training and workshop series uh, last semester, and we're kind of planning some more in the future, and we'll continue rolling out ones as, uh, as, as needs arise. So, um, Christina, I think we can go to the next final slide. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elisa and Andy. Um, to just kind of wrap up some of the key points that we've been making here, um, particularly at the end of the Tech Team website, our long-term goal is really to make sure that this project lasts beyond the terms of the grant that's funding us. And so all of our materials are being created, all of our trainings are happening with the hopes that we can pass this off to uh, future project work, like Risha talked about building up from one project to another to another, to continue expanding in that way, and or to hand off what is happening to the community groups so they can run their own um, Omeka SLS for something called like subsites, so they can run their own site within our Omeka S. We can provide all the technical infrastructure. They'll already have all the training and technology, and they can keep going with the project as they see fit into the future. But in order to do this, um, it takes a lot of communication. And so uh, I think one of the things that really resonated with me tonight is how much our groups, our project teams, talk back and forth amongst one another. We constantly iterate, revise, adapt, and we do this with our community members as well. We hear feedback from them. We even changed our project name at the start based on feedback. Um, and so we are constantly trying to make sure that we are best meeting the needs of our participants, um, whether that be community organizations or individuals on the ground. Um, and that is something we strive for for the future of this project. So thank you to the team for sharing all your amazing work tonight. I believe we're going to turn it over to Q&A. Um, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen where you can enter questions. And I will be reading them off and sharing them. So we do have one question to get us started. Um, Mary asks, uh, is that is the manual, the metadata manual you wrote about metadata and oral histories open access or could one reach out to get a copy of this? Um, Andy said he will answer and Elisa, if you want to add anything as well, feel free. Oh, I did not mean to uh, flag that. Elisa, would you like to talk towards this? My apologies. No, go for it. No. Uh, for it. This is something that is in progress. Uh, this will be uh, this is open access as with the uh, kind of other technical manuals, things like that, that we're in progress of creating. Uh, these are uh, iterative. So they're all at kind of draft stages now, and we're in progress of 
uh, revamping those based off of some uh, feedback that we received. Uh, but once those are uh, complete and in a pretty consistent state, we will be posting those to uh, the arapr.org website. And I did hear some rumors from the tech team that they're considering doing some oak open access materials um, so that more of these materials will be available to be shared and other project teams and groups can take them, remix them and use them into the future. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to put them in the Q&A. All right, we have another question. Um, do you see this project as being useful for other disasters? Was that part of the design? Is that a me question? <laughs> I think that probably um, I can jump in on that. Um, yes, our hope is that um, this kind of project will um, be able to expand and adapt to future disasters, um, but that's certainly dependent on our project teams, on our grant funding, and all sorts of relationships. But we do see the kind of work as being easily expandable, uh, whether that be in future projects that kind of break away from this group, whether that be in the work of community groups who take this on on their own um, to meet their own particular needs, um, or whether it be other groups, other um, community archiving projects that kind of emulate or uh, take a little bit of seed of what we're planting um, and start to build their own types of projects. So I do think that uh, we are prepared for a kind of rapid response. We originally weren't planning to talk about COVID-19 in our earliest iterations of the project because it hadn't happened yet. Um, and then as we were developing this grant proposal, um, all of a sudden uh, COVID appeared, things started locking down um, and that became an element of the project. So. But I would be happy to hear from other members of the team as well if you feel that um, the project can adapt or, or there are pieces of the project that can be um, implemented in future disaster response. Yes, I would like to add to what Christina just shared that we, we have been working on this project, uh, thinking about ways of providing other communities um, some sort of, you know, um, blueprint that could be follow up, you know, and um, but I want to I want to highlight something here, and and that is that our project is looking more into the responses and how those responses uh, have provided new ways of looking at things when you are in a setting where the the you know the the government kind of structures have completely collapsed so in that sense instead of talking about disasters we are talking about responses and how they have uh, allowed for those things that seems to be ordinary everyday life kind of things you know transform into extraordinary moments of community building experiences and so in that sense, that if that can provide some kind of, you know, model for other, you know, uh, projects that could not only collect those experiences for, but also, uh, 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 you know, communicate them, share them in such a way that they can um, um, fuel others, you know, to look into new ways of doing things then, you know, we have accomplished our goal. Risha, did I see that you wanted to add as well? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first, I'd just like to say that um, I think Marisa has an excellent point here. And, and on the one hand, I think it's very important to build empathy with, with communities that are on the front line of the doctor. But what has happened here it's the most amazing and rich thing in the world. And unfortunately, we're in a time now in which many communities are going to be facing these kinds of disasters. And
And so it's, it's not simply building empathy, although that's an incredibly important part. It's also saying what is replicable from these narratives, what is replicable from what communities have done and how instead of saying, okay, Puerto Rico had to build from the ground up and did an amazing job building from the ground up, but what if another community does not have to build from the ground up? And what if the government also says, as we're rethinking our response to disaster in the 21st century and they have to change, what if we thought about a community-centered response in which we learn from what people have already done? And a lot of, um, a lot, some researchers who are uh, engineers and, and environmentalists, etc., have contacted me to use the oral histories that we have already built to think about how are we going to reframe structural engineering? How are we going to reframe urban planning? How are we going to reframe public health issues as we move forward? Because the game has changed. And you know, Puerto Rico is at the forefront of that. And not only can we help people by respecting and listening to what they survive, but we can help multiple communities by saying, look, we learned lessons and we learned them on the ground. What if we didn't have to do that? And the other thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, when I envisioned the Me Maria project, it was a pedagogical project with the understanding that each one of my students would have survived the disaster and the trauma of Hurricane Maria. When we eventually go back to campuses, every student in your classes will be a survivor of COVID-19. And that is a participant in a global level trauma. And so the things that are being worked out in this project are highly applicable, not just to other disasters, but to multiple other situations. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marisa and Risha. Uh, yes, I ju just really want to hit home the idea of this project as a learning tool because uh, we do think that many communities are going to be facing, if not similar challenges, other forms of environmental crises or um, there's even talk about the prevalence of uh, new forms of, of disease spreading in as climate change increases and and Pop, uh, things warm. So we know that um, these kinds of tools, these kinds of response strategies are really vital to thinking through our strategies for community and communal based survival in the future. Um, and I think that leads us into the next question that I see. Um, so how do you think we can move towards more inclusive disaster response that empowers people of different identities to feel safe to ask for help? I can jump and, and, and answer that question and then leave the, the second question that Kayla asked to one of the team members. Um, this is a very big, broad question that we could even do a, a, a doctor's thesis about. Um, but um, in, in sort of trying to figure that out, I think that one of the ways that we can move to a more inclusive disaster response is um, to give the tools directly to the community-based organizations that respond to these to this populations, to these communities, and sort of decentralize the power from the government. Because one of the main problems that we've had in, in previous disasters and in Maria and in the, in the earthquakes in the southern part of the island and now with COVID-19 is that pretty much all of the resources and tools come from the government and then the, the community-based organizations sort of have to juggle and, uh, and do um, a lot of, of groundwork to sort of make things work and, and, and sort of give aid to their community. So I think decentralizing that, po that power from, from the government directly to those community-based organizations, to those communities, to the people who are directly affected by these disasters is one of the one of the tools, one of the approaches that we can have. And also what Mirza mentioned, highlighting more the response other than the disasters, focusing more on what has been what what has been those effective um, responses from each communities and which ones have worked better for them. Because 
each community is going to have different contexts and different necessities. So not necessarily all of them are going to benefit from a specific emergency response um, tactic or, or approach. So I think we have to um, dive more directly with each population, with each community to sort of find out what are their necessities and how can we adapt to them. If I can just jump in for a second and because I think language matters also. And so I wanted to, ch to touch on the whole like idea of empowering people. And like, for example, I'm not, or us as an institution, we're not empowering anyone. We're merely sharing the tools, our own resources for people to feel empowered, to take that on themselves. So again, taking away that idea of uh, very much a top-down mindset. I'm not, I'm not here to save anyone or MSU is not here to save anyone. It, it doesn't work like that. This is a partnership. Um, so very much like taking away that, that concept of um, structural concept basically. I really appreciate that, Elisa. Um, I know like technically my title on this project is project director, um, but that is a structure that is enforced by the grant funding agency. And so often when I talk about my work with the project, I say I'm its biggest cheerleader, um, that I coordinate emails and meetings, but everyone who's doing stuff on the ground. So everyone else on the team that you see here today is doing the work of the project and um, a, I, I would say maybe even a richer way than I am. And then beyond that, the people who are participating by the community organizations, the people who are telling us their stories, they are again, the, the people on the ground who are experiencing these real events, who are sharing their lived experiences, who are producing this innovative knowledge and who we are all learning from. And we are really all there as facilitators for that knowledge. and. Um, we hope that our participants share with us the, the desire and the value of um, making this, um, these knowledge systems available to a broader audience. Um, and, and so that is where our, our shared goal comes into play. So thank you, Elisa, for that comment. Like, answer that? Yeah, I think that what Elisa said is so important here because we're also working against generations of academics and scientists being extracted, coming to, to marginalized communities and saying, you have stories or you have communal ways of knowing, and I want them, and I'm going to take them and I'm going to remove them from the community. And so we also have trust here, trust issues here that are ingrained generationally. And, and then we're talking about uh, colonial context in, in this case as well. And, and so, using a feminist collaborative model and uh, we don't, uh, funding agencies might situate a single leader, but um, project design situates partners and partnerships and partnerships that happen off campus or, or outside of institutions that might carry those weights with them. Thank you, Risha. And I think, yes, that's an excellent point to point out. Um, uh, kind of the next question and the idea of how do we interact with the colonial government in disaster response. Um, so one of the questions we had was, um, how do we address the balance between sharing individual stories and at the same time um, advocating for or, or seeking government assistance, especially when there's been a lack? How do we achieve that balance in our communities or, or do we, or does it look like something else? I would like to comment on how this question might relate to the previous one in terms of the, of the film, of the documentary. And um, I, I, I have been thinking for a while and, and particularly when um, watching the, the documentary um, on this idea of webs, webs of solidarity and, and the notion that even though you know, in the film, we, we are able to participate in the retelling of stories of people who decided to come together, you know, one way or another, 
by means of individual actions or by means of, you know, connecting to others. Um, in, in the queer community, in order to look for responses, you know, to the very more basic needs. And um, what that tells us is that when we are dealing with responses to situations of disaster, we are always part of a collective. We are not really individuals kind of, you know, saving ourselves. We need the others. And we, we you know, when you are in a situation of emergency, and this is something that as a team, we talk a lot about, when you are in a situation of emergency, you need to reach out for the other. And, um, and you, you kind of experience everyday life, you know, as, as something that is unique, something that will provide you with particular experiences that would allow you to go uh, and, and survive the next day. So in that sense, um, I think that one of the lessons that we have learned, and I think that um, um, it, you know, that connects us with the, with the narratives of the field also, is that we, we, we have come to terms with the fact that institutions, you know, government institutions, political institutions are there, uh, might be useful, you know, for achieving, for us to achieve some gains, but they are not the, you know, the answer to, the, to, to what we need. The collective is the answer. And, and in that sense, that's what allowed us to move forward. That, is, that, you know, that idea, that notion of webs of solidarity was so nicely represented in the, in the film. And that's something that I could completely relate to, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of our own experiences here in Puerto Rico. Um, and so, yeah, that's how we move forward. That's, that's how we, we, um, we kind of, you know, respond to those situations of emergency. I think that was really beautifully said. Um, the, the sentence, the collective is the answer will really stick with me. Um, and I, I think that's a really powerful message that um, all of us would would say um, pertains to the experiences that we've heard, that we have um, been witness to, and that we've had the opportunity to work with. I know we are getting towards that time of night, so I do want to ask if any of the panelists have any final comments um, before we wrap up for the evening. All right, then I wanna thank New Canaan Library again for having us and hosting us. I wanna thank all of the panelists for joining us, all of the participants for listening to us and learning about our project. We're so excited to get to share that with you. Um, and I wanna say a special thank you to those of you in Puerto Rico right now, because I know it's a little later there than it is here. Um, so it it's, might be a late night, but we're so happy that you could join us. I just wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists. I really like that message that we just ended on of solidarity and the collective, like you all agreed. Um, and I just appreciate all of your time and sharing all of your expertise. I think that it's it's the clear, the synergy that you all um, are working towards. And I, I can't wait to hear that once you're all together and have that conference, like you said, you wanna have, I bet even more great ideas are gonna come out of that. So. On behalf of the library, on behalf of New Canaan Land Trust, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who attended this second part of our resilience series. You can head to newcanaanlibrary.org slash calendar for more information, like Aaron said, on our April event and our May event. So one last huge thank you to all of our panelists tonight. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, thank you so much.